Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Luis. I'm here in beautiful Papago Park in Phoenix, Arizona. It's the month of June right now, mid-June. Um, I'm here right about three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon. And all week long, we've been experiencing temperatures between 109 and 114. So it gets really hot. Now, I want you to understand, the heat hasn't even arrived yet because we've still got July and August to go through. Now you would ask, why am I here? Well, the reason that we're out here is because we want to experience the desert and try to get some understanding of the passages that we find about the temptation of Jesus Christ. They're found in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. I think being out here in the desert, uh, it's tough as long as you're out here with a hat, sunscreen and plenty of water you'll be okay you'd be surprised how many people need emergency services out here because they failed to bring out water and it helps me to understand what Jesus was going through because as I read the New Testament it says that after the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 that Jesus was taken by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil now, being here in the desert is going to help me make some comparisons that will help both of us understand this text much better. The first thing I want to share with you is that when you think about Jesus, there's something interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the Bible says that Jesus is the second Adam. Well, you already know where the first Adam is. He's in the, in the book of Genesis. And you can make a comparison contrast of the first Adam, first man that ever lived, Adam, and the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And so allow me to share with you four observations that are going to help us understand the temptations of Jesus. The first thing is understanding the similarity. Now, you all know that when Adam failed, the, the trial, the temptation, the test in Genesis, it had a monumental consequence. The book of Romans says that death entered into the world. So because he failed, man would know what physical death is. And when we're examining here in the New Testament, the temptations of Jesus, there is also a huge consequence, the spiritual life of man. And we're going to see how Jesus fares in those tests. But let me just share with you really quick four observations. First of all, when you look at the book of Genesis, the first Adam, you find that he was in a beautiful garden. The Bible calls it paradise. I can't even imagine how wonderful it would have been with a stream flowing with crystal clean water, beautiful plants, lush green grass. But the second Adam, Jesus, he was in a place like this, a desert. It was dry, it was harsh, it was hot. And when you think about this first Adam, he had an opportunity because the Bible says that God told him, of all the trees in the garden you may eat. So Adam could eat anything he wanted of all the trees except for one. And can you imagine the quality of food? Can you imagine he could have eaten anything he wanted as much as he wanted and he would have enjoyed it fully but the second Adam, Jesus, is in a desert, and the Bible says that he was fasting, that he didn't eat for 40 days. I call it starving to death. Man, it would have been tough. The first Adam had a lush garden with plenty of food, but Jesus had a rough, difficult terrain, difficult geography with no food. He would have been vulnerable. He would have been weak. He would have been struggling. The other observation I want to share with you is that the first Adam had a wife, Eve. Nice breeze. The wife Eve, and she, I, I can't imagine how wonderful Eve would have been, but the Bible would have said that she was the perfect helpmate for him. So Adam had the support and the love and the care of a wonderful wife, somebody to accompany him and help him. But Jesus had nobody. He was all alone other than the prayers that he gave to his father. The fourth observation I want to share with you is that the book of Genesis reveals that the serpent came into the garden, the craftiest creature that God had ever made. And he confronted not Adam, but Eve. 
So Adam really never had to face the devil face to face. He had Eve there as a buffer. But when you think about the second Adam, Jesus, he didn't have a buffer. He, after 40 days of not eating, after all of the struggle of being weak and vulnerable, he is confronted by the devil and he doesn't just get one temptation, he gets three of the most powerful, potent temptations that the devil can concoct. And we're gonna see how Jesus does with these three temptations. But to tell you the truth, we're gonna have to do these at home because it's really hot out here. I wanna get some water, get in some air conditioning, and we're gonna continue our study in a bit. I'll see you at home. Hey everyone, this is Pastor Luis again with ap for You, digging deeper into the scriptures. And boy, am I glad to be out of that heat. It was hot. I don't know if you noticed how shiny my face was. It was really, really hot out there. Uh, even my camera person was feeling a little bit off because it was so hot. So I'm glad to be here in the air conditioning. Well, hey, let's get back to our text here. We're looking at Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11, uh, accompanied by the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And we're focusing in on the temptations of Jesus Christ in the desert. So let's go to our text. And today we're going to examine the first temptation of Jesus. We'll, we'll look at the second one tomorrow. Let's look at this scripture here. The Bible says, um, and I'm using the English Standard Version, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we've got here in the first four verses, the first temptation of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, I want you to remember that there's a lot going on here, especially in verse 1. Verse 1 tells us here that Jesus was led up by the Spirit. This follows Matthew chapter 3, where we, fought, where we saw Jesus being baptized. Now, why was Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist? He was being baptized to identify with you and me in baptism. So he's connecting with us. He's identifying himself with us through baptism. And now he's identifying himself with us through the trials of temptation. It's why the Bible tells us in the book of, he in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says here, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Hebrews 2, 18. It continues in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so the scriptures reveal that Jesus is being led by the Spirit, just like you and I are to be led by the Spirit. If we have been born again, baptized, and following in Jesus, then and it's the Holy Spirit that's going to lead us through a process called the process of sanctification, where God is, is transforming us day by day into the very image of his son, Jesus Christ. And, and this happens through a time of testing. And you know, it, this is important to recognize this because the Bible says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, when you, when you examine the Bible and you see how it's used, the wilderness is a place of judgment, it's a place of testing, it's a place of deep communing with God. And so, so this is the right context for a place of testing. But verse 2 also says that after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, you know, the Bible calls it fasting, like I said, my opinion, but that's not fasting, that's dying of hunger. I cannot imagine going that long. Some of you may have, and maybe you're able. Uh, I just find that amazing that Jesus has been going through this period. And what's important to recognize is that this time of testing, this time of, of, of temptation, it isn't just one moment where three temptations are thrown at him. No, it's literally the entire period from day one all the way through day 40. So we're just seeing the, the intense ending of this time period. 
But I need you to understand that Jesus is, is very weak at this point. His human body has gone without sustenance and he's, he's vulnerable and he's in a weakened state. And that cowardly devil, this is when he comes. And it's not just with Jesus, it's with you and me. And I need you to recognize that it is when you are weak, when you're vulnerable, when you're tired, when there are imbalances in your life, when things aren't working right. That's always where he chooses because he wants to attack you as in your period of weakness. And so Jesus is in the desert. He, he was brought there by God. Now, now, why did God bring him there? It says to be tempted. Now, I know that there's a difference of opinion among scholars on that word in the original language, the word tempted. Some would say it is better translated uh, tested. And I, I'm honestly okay with both of them because it can be used either way. And, and this is how I understand it. When we are born again and we're beginning our process of sanctification, God grows us into the image of his son Jesus by testing. And the reason he does this is, is, is he wants us to grow in our faith, to strengthen our faith, and to mature our faith. Because I'll tell you right now, a faith that is not tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And so God wants us to have a strong faith. Now, in the text, God doesn't need to reveal to, to find out if Jesus has faith. No, remember, for Jesus, this is about identifying with us. But for you and me, just understand that in our life, God will never tempt you, as James says, but he will test you. And why does he test you? Because he wants to strengthen you and he wants to bring the best out of you. But that nasty devil, when God is in the process of strengthening you, bringing the best out of you, he always tries to hijack the process and insert himself and he brings temptations. Where God wants to bring the best out of you and make you stronger, Satan brings in temptations to bring the worst out of you and to make you weaker. And so I'm okay with that word, whether you want to say he was tempted by the devil or tested by God. In either way, both of those, I believe, are happening here. And they're happening in here, in this Judean desert, in a, in a horrible place. And, and, it, and this is going on, the Bible says, for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, I really believe that the number 40 is not just a literal number, it's actually a symbolic number that reveals how intense this time of testing and temptation were. I mean, think about it, how the Bible uses the number 40. Uh, it rained on Noah and his ark for how long? 40 days, 40 nights. Moses and God's people were wandering in the desert, how long? 40 years. Uh, when you think of Moses on Mount Sinai, ready to receive the word of God, 40 days, 40 nights. Um, when he sent spies to check out the promised land, 40 days. Goliath stood there mocking God's people for 40 days. And, and the Bible tells us, at least amongst the Jewish people, uh, Jewish law, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 3, I believe, it says that a person could not be whipped more than 40 times. Um, and so what the Jews would do is that they would only whip a person 39 times because uh, they didn't want to break God's law. And it's for that reason that Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 verse 24 says this. He says that the, from the Jews he received 40 lashes minus one. So he got 39 lashes. But when we think about Jesus, when he was whipped, when he was flogged, he was not whipped by the Jewish authorities. He was whipped by the Romans. And I truly believe that he was whipped 40 lashes. He was given the full dose, the highest level. And what's interesting, it says that he was taken into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. One interesting thing here, devil is not Satan's name. It's not his nickname. The word devil can actually be understood as some have called it his job description. It's what he does and it's how he does it. When you look at the word devil in, in the Greek, in the original language, you find that it's composed, it's constructed of two parts, dia and balo, dia and balo, uh, balas. And the word balo, balas, is to throw, you know, to hurl, to, to throw something. And um, the word dia means to go between uh, to perforate, to, to puncture, to go in the midst of. 
And when you put those two words together, what is it that the devil does? He's constantly throwing. He's throwing slander. He's throwing lies. He's throwing uh, jabs at the saints. And what is he trying to do? He's trying to perforate. He's trying to puncture. He's trying to break in. Where? Into our mind, into our heart, into our life. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 12 that he's constantly throwing accusations day and night before God. And, and so he's, he's always doing this to us. And I, and I need you to understand this, this, this slander, this accuser, this father of lies. You know, there's so many things. First Peter 5, 8 says that he is a, a lion roaming about seeking someone to devour. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says he's the prince of the power of the air. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 says that he presents himself as an angel of light. John chapter 8 verse 44 says he's the father of lies. He's a liar. He's an accuser. Revelation chapter 12. And so this devil is constantly harassing, coming when we are at our weakest state, when there's imbalances, when we're vulnerable, and he's punching and punching and punching, trying to break through, trying to break us down. And we need to put on, as the Bible says, the full armor of God so we can resist all of that. But this is who is coming to tempt Jesus. And uh, verse 3 says, and the tempter came. And you know when he comes, when we are at our weakest state. And he says to him, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And just like in the Garden of Eden, he brings the focus to food. Eve saw that that apple was good for eating and, and he's, she's saying, are you hungry? Do you want this? But here's the sneakiness of this old devil. L look at what's happening. The real test isn't the food, it's in what he first said. If you are the Son of God. Now I want you to remember, Matthew chapter 3 says Jesus was just baptized to be, to be identified with us, right? But do you remember what happened the moment Jesus came up out of the water? The Bible says that there was a voice from heaven and, and God's voice said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God said, this is my son. One chapter later, the devil is already testing that in Jesus' mind. And he's saying, if, if you are the son of God. And I want you to recognize that if the devil was willing to do that to Jesus, one chapter later, how much more so would he do that to you? And how does that look in our lives? Well, like Jesus, being in a fast, being in the desert, in a time of, te of, of great testing. When, there's moments in our lives when we're going through great testing. When, when we're hungry, we can't meet the bills, we aren't feeling well, we have health issues, relational issues. There's all sorts of imbalances in our life. And, and when that happens, the enemy comes in and he begins to question, are you really a child of God? Are you a daughter of God? Are you a son of God? Because I'll tell you right now that if you really were God's kids, you wouldn't be living like this. Because God's kids don't go hungry. God's kids don't get sick. God's kids are not poor. God's kids don't suffer like this. I really have doubts that you are who you think you are. You better check yourself. Because the last time I checked, God's children don't live like this. And think about how easy it is for someone who's going through great trial and, and like I said, just struggling to begin to doubt who they are, if you are. And I want to speak to all of you who are going through a difficult time right now, a difficult trial. I know the enemy's going to come and I know he's going to want to put you in doubt as to who you are. Can God really provide for you? Is he capable? Is he competent? Is he willing? Is he loving enough? Does he care to provide for you? Well, how does Jesus respond? He responds here, but he answered, it is written. Now, why did Jesus say this? Because I believe me, I know that Jesus could have just done it. He could have disobeyed. He could have been independent of God. He could have gone his own way and multiplied the, or, or made bread out of a rock, just like, just like he multiplied the fish and the loaves. He could have 
but he didn't. He was obedient to God, and he says, it is written. He could have conquered Satan. He could have beat Satan just by his words, but he chose to give us an example. And this is what's so important about this text. He is literally giving you and me a, a way of dealing with the trials and temptations of our life. When the devil comes a knocking, when the devil comes accusing and he's sharing lies and he's trying to cause us to, to have doubt, we say it is written. And Jesus did it. You know why he said it is written? Because he knows that's exactly what you and I can do. We can do exactly what Jesus did. He gave us a perfect example of what you and I can do every day. When we are under temptation, we go to God's word and we say it is is written and what did jesus say here he says it is written it is written um man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of god you can trust god he will provide for you god has made promises to you and he will keep every one of them don't let the enemy cause your faith to shake just because you're going through a difficult time god will be faithful he will take care of you as the old hymn says god will take care of you just remember stick with god's word it is written Wow, what a powerful way for this battle between Jesus and the devil to begin. We've, we've just examined this, this first test, this first temptation. In this next video, we're going to examine the second temptation. Thanks for listening in. Remember, I'm always pulling for you.